witness. A crime. Yeah, this is the one. Hey, you know the lady who lives here? She's three days late on her car payments. Three full days! That ain't no lady. That's a... That's a car thief! Me? I'm the repo man. You know what that means? That means what's mine is mine. And if you're late on any payment, if you're late. What's yours is mine too. You know the way at the start of the last episode, we went through uh, different nationalities, you know, and now people know that we're Irish. <laughs> and now people know that we're all shite at accents <laughs> as well. <laughs> but I was wondering, is it prejudice to not make fun of, like, all of the countries? What are you going for here, is it? We'll name check every country on the show, that way no one can be mad. How about that? <laughs> I could do Swedish. Oh, yeah, cool. Hurdy birdie. <laughs> To the Italians, Papa the Poopy, Papa the Poopy, <laughs> okay. And to the Mexicans, he, he, man. <laughs> uh, Spain, <laughs> uh, Singapore, oh. <laughs> amazing. Australians, Crocodile Dum Dark, no, he big loop are you? No, that sounds That's like terrible. Limerick or something. <laughs> That's right, we never slag off the Irish, do we? Someone put a bomb in me potato. <laughs> there you go. OSW Review. All Irish, all racist. <laughs> Nineties. school wrestling video podcast filmed in glorious grapple vision and encoded with blast processing we chronologically critique the hulkamania era pay-per-view by pay-per-view you know we could just copy and paste this every yeah episode, right? that's what i say, it's like I say the, the roadrunner me <laughs> <laughs> a new episode happy days are here again <laughs> just eat a thousand pies <laughs> OSW review the Triforce of Awesomeness. So we have the Triforce of Kayfabe, Mr. OC. Right. The Triforce of Loudness. <laughs> <laughs> and myself, the Triforce of Pretentiousness. Hey. Jay Hunter. And tonight we say goodbye to 1991. It's this Tuesday in Texas. How's it going, lads? Alright, how are you? Grand. Any, uh, I wasn't any... asking you. <laughs> <laughs> you could say lads. <laughs> Anyway, we got lots and lots of love for our last episode, I'm happy to say. And yeah, curiously enough, YouTube are very nice as well. Like, YouTube comments. Oh, right. Sorry, I said, like, YouTube told you that they liked your show. <laughs> Sorry for cancelling you, like, <laughs> sorry for kicking you off. Yeah, WWE, very stringent in this PGR. They just don't want any of their stuff on YouTube, but much like uh, Jurassic Park, life finds a way. <laughs> oh, I have a question for you, Steve, actually. <clears throat> Colin from Louisiana asked, can you put two pillows down because you bang the table a lot? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Colin from Louisiana asks for less anti-American sentiment, please. No. no. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> just for that, <laughs> you fucking yanks. <laughs> 
It's December 3rd, 1991, from the Freeman Coliseum in Shawn Michaels' hometown of San Antonio. It's this Tuesday in Texas. Commentators Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan welcome us and run down the card. Monsoon cut off Brain mid-promo, and then you can see Brain turn around and just give out before turning back around and putting his fake camera smile back on. It was really cool. <laughs> Attendance tonight is a sellout 8,000, paying an average of $12.50 per ticket. What? That's awesome. That's so cheap. To see the show with 140,000 houses tuned in at home. Uh, unlike WrestleMania 2, where the crowd showed up for four matches, half an hour, and watched the rest of it on telly. Well, the live crowd got to see five dark matches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. Four wretched jobber matches. Oh, God. And one huge matchup, Ric Flair versus Roddy Piper. A fucking undercard match. Which saw, or rather didn't see, Flair pinning Piper. So, uh, you know the old um, proverb, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around, doesn't make a sound. If Piper jobs and no one tapes it, it's a really job. <laughs> <laughs> Much like episode two, the wrestling classic pay-per-view, there is no official home video release of this Tuesday in Texas. However, the entire show was bundled in with random matches from earlier in the year on Super Tape 22. Super Tape. Super Tape. <laughs> Sean Mooney introduces this Tuesday in Texas saying it plays just as well any day of the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, I reckon WWF didn't think the show was strong enough to sell as a standalone release, so there you go. On the tape, we actually got IRS's tax tips but, uh, and an eight man tag as well for right. 30th of July. Uh, could they have sold this, right? And then on the box say, like, bonus five matches for still like 15 bucks. This is like unfit for television yes. level jobber match you know you could have argued that about the first match oh you haven't <laughs> <laughs> how about we'll run down this half length half price show and discuss how it did afterwards yeah this Tuesday in Texas we're back in the bowels of the building, where they basically re-recorded the closing promo from the end of the Survivor Series pay-per-view. Mean Gene is with The Undertaker and his manager, Paul Bearer. Bearer says that they will eviscerate Hogan sometime before this Tuesday in Texas. What? And Taker repeats his vow to bury Hulkamania. I was like, Bearer, you know, he's obviously not listening to himself. He's like, oh... I could say anything I want. <laughs> You've tuned out, haven't you? <laughs> it's a good impression, Jake. Oh, thanks. It's all that uh, school cabbage as a child. <laughs> the opening bout is for the Intercontinental Championship. The champion, Brett the Hitman Hart versus Skinner. <laughs> <laughs> so, Skinner is top of the queue for an IC title shot. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how? <laughs> exactly. Not only did he get easily rolled up by Sergeant Slaughter at Survivor Series last month, he also failed to eliminate anyone because his team got clean sweeped. So he must have convinced Jack Tunney he was worthy by his amazing performance at Superstars in between the pay-per-views where he didn't wrestle. (laughs) Prior to this, Skinner's been jobbing to Virgil on the house show circuit and Hart is in a feud with the Mountie. So, uh, yeah. Honestly, you know what would have been a much better match? Red Hart versus Crocodile Dundalk. <laughs> Steve does this as well. Do you remember he, he had something like a monk? He was going to have How can a you monk. not know that name? Oh, Rosputin. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a fucking Hold name. Hold on. Let's put it out there. Don't tell me that Rosputin, the mad monk, would not get over. So I imagine he's like Friar Ferguson. This, I'd, I'd imagine he's slightly more like Rasputin than <laughs> Fire Ferguson. But he's a monk as well. People tried to kill him like 20 different times yeah. and they couldn't. And then they finally <laughs> poisoned him, shot him, rolled him up in a carpet and dumped him in the river. And that finally killed him. So do we have to job him out 20 times? <laughs> and... Uh... <laughs> Wait, that's Rose Beaton. What about Crocodile? I've never broken this out yet, but the Rose Beaton character was specifically sent to drive you men. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brett gives his glasses to a girl in the crowd who was terrifyingly excited. A lot of screaming women. Mm. Yeah. It was a real, like, 
house show crowd it's almost, wasn't it? There. Really it's a big crowd, but it got a real house show feel because there's you can hear individuals shouting and mm-hmm. screaming. Yeah, it's and the ratio of children to adults for this show was definitely skewed towards kids and you know the way like back in the 80s the older crowd uh, yeah we got a shot of Skinner's claw Heenan claims it's the left parthesis on an alligator to which Monson quips will you be serious <laughs> both men exchange shoulder locks someone tell them that the pay-per-view has started it's not a dark match stop with the damn rest holes Bret Hart had done a couple of arm drags and then Skinner went to do a hip toss on Brett, but then Brett kept hold of the arm and rolled through and turned the hip toss into a countering arm drag again. That was really cool looking. Probably the best spot of the, the entire match. The only spot in the entire match. <laughs> yeah, actually, <laughs> other than uh, going out and wasting time, <laughs> which is not a spot. I love Brett, and I mean, he's shown in the past few pay per views how fucking awesome he is, but this fucking match, rest hold after rest hold, as you were saying. Not only that, but he works the arm for like the first five minutes. You know, this master of ring psychology. Working the arm for what reason? Because he's eventually wants to slap on the sharpshooter. Oh, and your legs. <laughs> <laughs> so, didn't understand. You can't just blame Skinner for this. Brett was like, not even trying here. Brett's in control until Skinner sends Brett shoulder first into the ring post. Monsoon shits on Skinner's ring attire, as well as his abdominal stretch. Oh, it was a bit harsh. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it looks alright. Finally, some plot. A Skinner picks up his tobacco cup and distracts the ref so he could nail Brett with his alligator claw. Monsoon rightly chastised Skinner for working on his leg after spending so much time working on Brett's shoulder. Skinner hits his finisher, which is the slop trap, the reverse mm-hmm. DDT, but only garners a two. So, did you uh, like Skinner's big nasty black tongue? <laughs> looks like a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> I think I quite like the chewing tobacco gimmick. It's so nasty. Yeah. That's something that no one in this country gets. There's no one that chews tobacco in Ireland at all. Mm-hmm. What about like sailors on the docks? They yeah. don't like chew rough shag or something. <laughs> <laughs> Hitman makes his comeback, running through his signature moves, hitting the backbreaker, and then a second rope elbow, and finally gets the sharpshooter for the verbal submission and successful title defense at 1346. Awesome sharpshooter. Brett looked like he beat this man easily, like in kayfabe terms. Like he's definitely moving up the card. You know, he singles, no more time, like and all that shit. Beating a bushwhacker, this yeah. Thing. yeah, a terrible match though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely forgettable match. It's not bad. It's just Brett's worst pay per view match to date. So no. Backstage, Sean Mooney is with Jake Roberts. My goodness, he is a world class promo. Oh, it's amazing. He, I like I'll just so splicey splice. Please do. Jake Roberts, the big decision from President Jack Tunney, there will be no reptile allowed in your corner. Now, earlier I saw the macho man and his lovely bride, Elizabeth. Randy Savage is wired to the max. He cannot wait to get you into the ring. So what? As cold as a razor blade, as tight as a tourniquet, like the skin on a dying man. Randy Savage, the last time I seen you, You were flailing like some helpless child, drowning. Drowning from what? Drowning from the very poison that was running through your veins after that snake had chewed on that arm. For some time he did chew. Now you look at my eyes, Randy Savage, and you see two black holes in the sky. But you look at that snake eyes and you'll see something so cold and so devilish and so deliberate. Yes, he takes care of what he has to, does what he has to, just like me. Your eyes. Your eyes weren't even there, man. You were out. You were gone. But you know whose eyes I enjoyed the most? (laughs) Do you? Elizabeth's. Pupils so small, so intent, so scared for the man that she loved. And what a rush I got, man. Up and down my back. It felt so good. My hair felt like it was tingling. I mean, I had goosebumps all over my body listening to you squeal for a man that could not do anything but flail around and couldn't help himself at all, you know? And see the thing about Jack Tunney barring the snake from the corner. Let me tell you something, Jack Tunney. When I was brought into this world, I could not rob, I could not steal, I could not lie, I couldn't even cheat. But boy, did I have some help learning. You have taught me so well. So you see, 
It is not my fault, anything that I do out there. You have given me the right to. You have almost pushed the button to make me do it. You have pulled the trigger. So anything that I do is your fault. Snake in the corner, trust me. Trust me. Gee, this guy, holy shit. I said like, I've had written down here that anything I say can't do it justice, please play the entire thing. Mm. Just, it was so good. It's probably one of the best problems I've ever heard. Mooney was good in this segment. Like Jake was so incredible that he just raised that clown. <laughs> <laughs> well, like he did well at holding the microphone. Yeah. No, but <laughs> <laughs> Look at it there. <laughs> Perfectly vertical. <laughs> I also thought that he that he also did a good job in like looking terrified as well. Mm. The imminently reinstated Macho Man is with Mean Gene. He says his rush will be looking at the love in Liz's eyes after defeating Roberts, and oddly enough, Jake's theme song hits, telling Macho to wrap it up. You know? mm -hmm. yeah, it was really disappointing after such an awesome promo from Jake. Yeah, I can understand he's a little bit flustered, if you will, a bit rambly. He says, uh, I'm not going to trust you. You've shown that we can't trust you. You know, the whole idea of trust me is uh, obviously disingenuous. Um, He's you know? taking him for his word. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> trust me. Oh, oh. oh really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can trust you. You keep disappointing me. <laughs> um, yeah, so the match we've been waiting for has finally arrived. Macho Man Randy Savage versus Jake the Heel Roberts. Get a quick recap. Jake and The Undertaker broke up Liz and Macho's wedding reception after SummerSlam. And he had his snake bite Macho's arm right before the Survivor Series. And he's been none too civil taunting Liz as well. Macho boots it down the entranceway, ambushing Roberts while he's still walking to the ring. His outfit is colourful patches on a black and red checkered material. Steve? Blackjack. So they were black and white. Uh, Dennis the Menace Bar. Oh, well done. Bam. Get I it. love it. <laughs> yeah. I hear uh, he looks like the extras bin on Art Attack. Nice. <laughs> uh, after Macho's initial flurry, Jake takes control, focusing on Macho's snake bitten forearm. Um, Macho's arm is still bleeding. How long has it been since he was bitten? Two weeks. Yeah. And he's still bleeding. Is this even feasible? No. Because, you know, like, snake bite is either hematoxic, which means it breaks down the blood cells, or it's neurotoxic, which means it uh, it affects your, your nerve transmission. He'd either be dead or not bleeding <laughs> <laughs> if he was treated. So, yeah, yeah, doesn't make any sense. Although it does look cool. It looks great. Which like fucking, wrestling is mainly a visual thing, so... It's like, you know, who is a Christian or something going through a glass table? The ref comes out with a bloody towel. <laughs> that the TNA yeah, trick? Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> it was acceptable in the 80s, lads. Just like... <laughs> the plow into the face. White battery. I quite like the start. Savage not fucking around. Because this is what you should do in, in a blood feud. Pardon the pun. And then it was over in a flash. Referee Earl Hebner has to ramble roll out of the way after a series of Irish whip reversals. The finish of the match sees Macho escape the DDT, charging Jake into the turnbuckle and hitting the top rope elbow and getting the clean three. So Savage wins at 6.24, but oddly enough, his theme doesn't play, i.e. there's still storyline <laughs> left. Yeah. When the match ended, the fans weren't that happy, like, there was definitely audible boos and a bit of a mixed reaction. But I think it was more because they felt like they were being shortchanged with the match being so short. But then the afters happened and it was awesome, so. Yes, Savage isn't done with Roberts. Although official Tony Garcia takes the chair, he grabs the ring bell. But thanks to Hemner's intervention, Jake plants Macho with the DDT. The crowd are absolutely mental, feverish here for this feud. Jake hits a second DDT and acquiesces to Earl's request to leave. Jake thinks better of it and returns to ringside, lifting up the ring apron and retrieving a black bag said to contain Jake's Cobra Lucifer. So he wasn't in the corner. Uh, do you know how small the bag was? 
Mm. Uh, you know, Damien used to come in a massive fucking... Okay, I, Damien was a python, right? So he's obviously bigger, but... I'd rather just see him pull out a massive bag and pull out a tiny little... <laughs> party <laughs> snake. <laughs> and throw it at him. <laughs> Elizabeth enters the ring and pleads with Jake to stop. He delivers a third DDT, puts on his black snake handler's glove as Jake verbally terrorises Liz. She doesn't do a great job, mostly saying, Leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than her corpsing or her incessant screaming, which happened in the last couple of shows. So, you know, it's well, slightly better. She does a better job than Hebner. She's just like, Do you <laughs> I was like, man, I can't go much higher. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we're singing wedding songs. Um, but he's like, no, come yeah, on, yeah, come yeah. on, come on. Yeah, yeah, well, he's running out of things to say, and I don't blame him for fuck's sake. Get out. <laughs> yeah, oh, you. <laughs> Will you stop? Hey, <laughs> damn it. You want to save his ass, you better start begging now. Jake, she's Let begging you now. You. Leave him alone. Liz doesn't do a great job, and Jake grabs her by the hair and delivers a devastating slap, which gets monster heat. Did you see he does the, the old foot stomp when he slaps her? Does he? Yeah. Nice. That's great. So he uh, cardi slapped her. Yeah. Uh, I thought the extra glove gimmick for taking out the... the uh, does a viper or cobra? Cobra. It looked awesome, and great heat for it as well. No, not for the glove. <laughs> 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 um, the match itself yeah, felt like the high drama closing kind of 10 minutes from the get-go. Tony ushers Jake away from ringside as Patterson and Wurzel attend to Randy and <laughs> usher him towards the back. Monsoon decrees that Jake should be suspended. There's a Wurzel alert in massive <laughs> writing here. Where were these lads, you know, five minutes ago when... When, when he was, was getting, getting three DDTs yeah, yeah. and the yeah. snake was, yeah. was brought, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a full match. It, it was, wasn't a match. It was an angle, match. Like. The actual match part was just a background to the post-match angle, which you know to keep the feud going. Why couldn't the Jake gone over in the match and then did a post-match beatdown to make Macho winning the eventual match that they have, and I hope they do mean more because he's already beaten them. That's very true. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. <laughs> I have nothing to add to that. You are correct. I thought it was actually quite odd to see a big story development on pay-per-view because usually those are on TV to build to the pay-per-view match, you know? Um, so we never actually get to see if the Cobra was in Jake's bag because they just alluded to it. So Tony can't say for sure that Jake broke the rules. Uh... Would you like a bit of update? Kayfabe breaking on this. I would love it. The snake was not in the bag. The cobra died shortly after the snake bite angle. Mm. So maybe, like, Macho poisoned the snake. Oh. Maybe he was carrying some. No, never. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Backstage, Mean Gene calls Jake a sicko, and he contends Liz should stand up for herself and loved striking her. So how do you feel about Jake Roberts turning into a woman beater? <laughs> this was so awesome, because he said, hitting Liz felt so good that I'd gladly pay to hit her again. <laughs> that is heat fucking magnet right there. Fucking <laughs> where's Chaz? Fuck off. Austin just hiding in the corner, <laughs> hoping that Jay doesn't see him. <laughs> so we yeah, had Jeff Jarrett, Chaz, Chuck Palumbo all cracking one off. <laughs> All having the wife beater gimmick. I have to say, well, with the exception of Chuck Palumbo, it gets over. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Match number three. It's the rematch from WrestleMania 7. The Battle of the Roydy Magoos number two. It's the warlord in his cartoony black W shoulder affair versus the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith. Now, Warlord is with his manager, Harvey Whippleman, who is brought into the WWF by his good mate, Sid Justice. Initially, he was Dr. Harvey Whippleman, who listened to Jobber's heartbeats after taking a shellacking from one of his wrestlers. 
That's great. But the gimmick was dropped rather sharpish. Uh, he managed mustachioed man, big bully Busick, but he's gone, so he's moved up to the Warlord. Do you like the classic heel in black versus the face in white? I, I, I no. know you love it. I know you love it. I'm, I don't care. Steve? I love it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Monsoon postulates that he's never seen Warlord so big. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> he also then proceeds to go on and not talk about the match. Fucking Bulldog is scary at this point. He looks uncomfortable. Yeah. It's like, it seems like we talk about Warlord being huge more. But he's so tall that he wears the mask way better than Bulldog, who's what? He's, he's like probably slightly taller than average, like 5'10", 5'11", maybe. Mm. That's why he's not alive anymore, I yeah. suppose, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Warlord is closer to being straight as yeah. opposed to a heart shape, which yeah. is the upper yeah. torso of uh, Davy Boy. Yeah, I fucking love these guys. Two mastodons. <laughs> <laughs> Stunts. <laughs> Muffins. <laughs> Warlord fakes out a test of strength and Davy Boy retaliates with a headbutt to the dick. <laughs> the lads miss a catch opponent from the splash to the outside spot. It was disappointing. Uh, is it me or did Warlord shave a tuft of hair into a W mm-hmm. on his occiput there? Did yeah. he? Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, good stuff. Mm. Uh, much better than the fake Z that Zeus had because he just yeah. painted his on. Warlord controls the lion's share of the match, constantly cutting off Bulldog's comeback. Bulldog escapes Warrior's bear hug, but walks into a gorgeous belly-to-belly gut wrench suplex. It looks very safe as well, and he gets mega height on it too. Uh, much like WrestleMania 7, Sunset Flip by Davey, and we get the wonderful... Hello, Hello. Except it was shit. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was a oh, oh, three, four, four. It was amazing. Uh, who counters into opposing pin, just like WrestleMania 7. Monsoon smartly covers Warlord not fully applying the full Nelson as heelishly grabbing Bulldog's hair instead. See, it was, it was not even... He was basically just touching his temple. It was like, really bad. Look, uh, but then again, though, he's probably so massive that he physically couldn't do it so yeah this this was no Bobby Lashley spot anyway while he he has the full Nelson locked on you to get a close up of the warlord's back and it's just a fucking island of back knee like it's just, it's disgusting yeah and fucking hell that full Nelson just went on forever the crowd are fucking dead at that point would the wrestlers not think we better do something here because Nobody gives a shit anymore. Yeah, it's like they didn't even build up to a spot where he breaks out. It's like mm. Bulldog tries to break out and he can't. And Warlord must know, okay, he's in this move ages. He hasn't yet gotten enough power to break out. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, I, I must be near to ending it. Yeah. He's like, eh. He just yeah. throws him down. Oh, sorry. And also, uh, Monsoon actually mentions that Davy Boy Smith gets stronger the longer he's in the full Nelson. Yeah, he did. We were right all along. He's been listening to the podcast. He's show. been listening to the podcast. <laughs> From the grave. <laughs> it's a graveyard smash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Well, Jay, well done. Yeah. Well done Does that make the show or does it get cut? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bulldog returns with a wonderful delayed vertical suplex, which surprisingly only garners a two. A funny moment. Whippleman walks up to the camera tries to light a cigar it doesn't light and he's like he just blows into the lid there's no smoke at all and then he says um, me and Warlord are the best thing in the WWF keep the camera away from it (laughs) the finish sees Warlord escape the position for the running power slam something that just will happen with more frequency it's like that and the dominator the most countered moves in history Uh, but Davey awkwardly applies a crucifix pin and gets the three it was a very sloppy looking pin. Bulldog did try this at WrestleMania 7 and he got a Samoan drop for his troubles, but it works tonight. So Bulldog wins at 12.47. He gets the big W from the big W. <laughs> yeah. What happened since WrestleMania? The WrestleMania match was so good and this was so shit. Yeah. Um, is it just because they're both bigger and slower and shitter? You know the way if you put on more muscle mass, you sacrifice cardio, maybe it's just hit that tipping point where it's 
they're both gassed and they just need five minutes Jesus. in a ten minute match yeah. to recover. <laughs> oh my god, so the story, the real story of this match is Davy's hair. Yeah. By the end of this, his hair has become a big floor mop. <laughs> hair like a madman's arse. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Dwayne Dibley on <laughs> Oh, what'd you say? With his hair, the bulldog has become a poodle. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> We're not going to sing that song anymore because Jim Davidson is a pedo with Jimmy Savile and all. Is he? Yeah, I remember reading about that a couple of weeks ago. You can't fucking say that, though. Allegedly. (laughs) (laughs) Backstage with Sean Mooney, Randy Savage is furiously distraught over Jake touching his wife. We were all appalled by what took place following the match between the Macho Man Randy Savage and Jake the Snake Roberts. You heard the comments by Jake Roberts gloating over... Shut up! But Randy Savage, I'm just as upset over what took place out there as you are. The greatest Elizabeth. The greatest Elizabeth. You understand that? The greatest Elizabeth. Snake the greatest. Yeah. And I'll never forgive myself. It's the worst day of my life that I let him do that. You laid your hands on Elizabeth. You laid your hands on Elizabeth. It's my fault. It's my fault. Man, you told who said you said something about hanging with you show you the dark side. Let me tell you something, man. Let me tell you something right now. Let me tell you something right now. I'm gonna get you, man. Yeah, I'm gonna get you. And there ain't gonna be no stopping me, man. I'm gonna get you. You can trust me that I said that. You already got what you wanted here. You know, I didn't even get a piece of you. I didn't even get a piece of him! I blame myself! Man, I'm telling you. Touched Elizabeth, man. Touched Elizabeth. Unbelievable, man. That's it. It's over. It's over. No control, brother, man. I'm telling you right now, man. I'm going to get you, man. I'm going to get you here. I'm begging right now. You made her beg, huh? You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm telling you something right now. I'm going to get you. And I'm telling you something, man. I'm telling you, it ain't over. It ain't even started. You understand that? You understand that? I blame myself. I'm going to get you. Yeah. Get out of here. He's so angry with himself and Roberts. He can barely speak. It's like really emotional promo. Thought it was brilliant. It was very, very good. Uh, he swears revenge on Roberts. Great production of the segment as Macho veers out of the usual confines of the pay-per-view backdrop. And so it makes the camera work. Instead of it being really steady, it gets mm-hmm. all shaky and handheld. And So yeah, fantastic. What do you think? I thought this was phenomenal. Just amazing. Can't, can't do it justice. Play it. Uh, return to form. <laughs> from from uh, 20 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, all right. Match number four. Led to the ring by Sensational Sherry, we have the tag team of the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, and the Repo Man. Who? <laughs> 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 I have a few points to ask uh, about what? this gimmick, okay? Why is the Repo Man dressed like a thief or a vagrant? Surely he would have like an official uniform of the repo men and like a name badge <laughs> and, and not be like <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't make any yeah. sense. It, what he's doing is fine. He he has no need to sneak. Yeah, because like surely a repo man would knock on your door and inform you that he is taking your stuff and maybe even make you sign for stuff. Like he wouldn't Come up to your gaff at like half four in the morning and just tow your car away and be like, (laughs) (laughs) That's what he does. (laughs) Then he's a thief. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Having taken two pay per views off, he's back. Barry Darso, we've already done that, repackaged as the nefarious repo man. Loyal to Vince McMahon, he's kept his job. 
he was built up on TV with some great vignettes where he'd break into people's houses and like preemptively repossess their car, cackling, what's mine is mine, and what's yours is mine too. Oh. <laughs> it's so is he awesome. married to the people he had taken a shit from? <laughs> His signature prop is a tow rope where he tied jobbers' feet to the ropes and then just chastised them. Awesome comedy heel heat here. I love it. Yeah, yeah I, I've got memories of this gimmick from when I was a kid. Um, like. I imagine he doesn't have a uniform because he's self employed <laughs> with a government contract. So he is just a thief. <laughs> A career criminal. <laughs> Hence the sneaking. Um, yeah, the dudes cut his hair and lost a ton of weight. Man, looks like a different person. Than... You would never know. Yeah, I'd never guess he was Demolition Smash. Until he goes up to the camera and goes... <laughs> <laughs> Virgil's theme hits. And Mr. Ten Dollars Richer Virgil and Tito Santana tagging together... For the first of a long and storied relationship. None of those are true. (laughs) (laughs) But he is a tenor richer. Round two of what bar is it? (laughs) Steve, you got an update for us. I have two people in in this match. We have Tito Santana in his new lovely matador gear. You remember the lollipop things called the drumstick? They were green Mm. and orange. Very nice. Mm -hmm. And Virgil... He is a nogger. (laughs) 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 Let's take an ad break questionnaire. (laughs) (laughs) I think so. (sighs) Erwin R. Scheister has a real treat for you today. I'm going to be giving you some tax tips. I like to call them Erwin R. Scheister's Top 10 Tax Tips. And if you follow these tips, you'll become a law-abiding citizen and pay your fair share in taxes. Tip number 10 goes like this. Stop claiming your pet animals as household dependents. Number 9. Start claiming all that cash you made at your last garage sale. Number 8. Stop hiding those tips under the mattress. Number seven. Get rid of that gas-guzzling four-door and try walking to work to cut down on your fuel expense claims. Number six. Start claiming all that money you made mowing the neighbor's lawn while collecting unemployment. Number five. Get a priest to sign a receipt for all those so-called Sunday donations. Number four, business expense claims are for that, business, not weekend getaways to Orlando. Number three, having your daughter's buck teeth fixed doesn't constitute a proper medical claim. Number two, try mailing your return on time for a change. And the number one tip for all you Coliseum video fans, quit your crying and pay what's due or IRS will audit you. Repos with Teddy as he villainously stole back DiBiase's million dollar belt and clocked Virgil to cost him the match at Survivor Series Showdown. Post-match Tito came out to protest and presumably kick the ropes. (laughs) (laughs) Episode 1, WrestleMania (laughs) 1. And that sets up this match. Okay, how long has this... DiBiase Virgil feud been going there. Virgil turned on DiBiase, turned face on DiBiase and Rumble 91. Mm. Oh, Jesus. Get over it. <laughs> and all honestly, like, that's pretty awesome. For oh. Virgil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what awesome matches have they had? I mean, yeah, well, that's very true. Come on. Yeah. Get up. <laughs> 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 Monsoon quips that Virgil couldn't have picked a better partner than El Matador. Do you agree with that? No, no, I do not agree with that. I'd say Hulk Hogan would be much better yeah, tag yeah, team yeah, partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. His win loss ratio. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like the dodge the charging bull spot with Tito sidestepping Repo? Oh, missed that. So Repo would run the ropes and Tito would like, hey, 
Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean it's any good though. Here's yeah. a like a handy tip: if you aim for the middle of them and put your hands out, you're probably going to get them. Either way, <laughs> doesn't matter if he goes left or right; you're still going to get. Them. What if he stays in the middle? You get your head fucking. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, oh, so was it? Uh, remember when Edge had to quit there, like Mania before last? I think it was like the SmackDown before Mania. Edge goes to give Brodus Clay a spear on the outside, and like you said, he hits him head in the yeah. gut and goes down like a sack of spuds, yeah. holding his neck. And surprise, surprise, ten days later, he's fucking done. Like, mm. so yeah. I love how Repo Man sneaks around the ring. He's awesome. Darso tries to Pearl Harbor Tito, but he's too slow. Chicken Morango. Virgil tags in and gets ready to box. And the ref rightly stops him to remind him that closed fists are illegal. Awesome. Because that's his gimmick. It, like the shitty shadow boxing. Like that's all he does. Well, well Taker does that. A big show does that. I, I, but they wrestle as well though. I know but are wrestlers allowed to do it now whereas in back in the 90s they weren't? Well, back in the day you were definitely not allowed to do it. About four years ago they just the referees stopped complaining at the wrestler. Now closed fists are illegal. Fine. Punch all you want. Oh, by the way, after Virgil tries his boxing shit, he subsequently gets battered. <laughs> First time on pay-per-view, DiBiase uses the turnbuckle string to choke Virgil. We actually got a uh, question from Billy from OSW. He asks, would you still hate Virgil if you got your tenor back? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um. Oh. I wouldn't have minded so much, but I felt, I know, I'm more pissed off at myself rather than Virgil because I, For I being was a calmed. sucker. He saw me coming a fucking mile away. Like. <laughs> Big pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> Time to trim the mark. <laughs> So would Virgil cease to get grief if you got your money back? Right? Um, yeah, I, I suppose you would. I suppose you would. But, you know, fair fucks to him. He was on that F that night. I <laughs> Hot tag to the Ariba man as he cleans house, hitting the flying forearm on Repo and signals for the donkey punch. DiBiase swipes at Tito and Repo sends him tumbling over the top rope. Uncharacteristically, DiBiase succeeds with a second rope axe handle. The heels have impressive fluidity. Man, they're very good as a tag team. Their gimmicks match as well. It's like the rich guy and the man who steals from the poor. Nice. <laughs> I hope to see them tag in the future, but mm, I doubt it. Yeah. Oh, it's an amazing gimmick. Robin Hood. Wait for it. Except he's robbing people who live in the hood. Rob in hood. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll put that next to Rose Butin. Yes! <laughs> and, and Crocodile. <laughs> and push them into a furnace. <laughs> as Virgil gets another hot tag, the match disintegrates into a brawl as Sherry mistakenly nails Teddy with her shoe. Repo knees Virgil in the kidney and, yeah, that's enough to keep him down for a three count. DiBiase recovers, makes the cover and gets the win. Heels go over at 11.16. Um, it wasn't too bad. It was a bit of fun, um, but yeah, who gives a shit, really? I thought the match was going to be terrible, but it was all right. And I thought the Ariba man looked good. I have it written down here, Steve. Steve, did you get your tenors worth watching this match? <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you anything for me, Will? It's just that Virgil gets a massive pop when he goes to batter Sherry. <laughs> Man, what battery is over? <laughs> it really is. Backstage with Hulk Hogan. Mean Gene states the obvious. We're in Texas. This is Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Fine research there, mate. The Hulkster thanks Tony and the teeny Hulkamaniacs and tells The Undertaker, What you gonna do when Hulk Hogan buries you right here in Texas? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. The Undertaker, yeah. like, is the... British 1800s. Riding his mustache. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, uh, Hulk Hogan definitely looking smaller and less oily as well. 
and remarkably happy for someone who lost his belt nine days mm. ago. Mm. This is a John maybe, Cena promo. Maybe he knows something we don't. Yes, it's time for the main event. Hit some kind of music. <laughs> Wrestling Federation Champion, it's The Undertaker with manager Paul Bearer, and he's out first. Boo. <laughs> Versus the challenger, Hulk Hogan, who couldn't be bothered doing his full entrance and nonchalantly tears his t shirt on the entranceway. I see. Fucking house show. Mm. I only tear my t shirt for $60, brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Then he $12.50. fifty. <laughs> Stupidly, the bell rings as Taker and Bearer put the boots to Hogan. That's DQ. Yeah, good night, folks. <laughs> Is this match an ODQ? Because it felt no, like it. No, no. V1, you said this in episode 17, our Rumble 1990 podcast, where Hogan eliminated Warrior in the Rumble, that Hulk Hogan is the greatest babyface of all time, but he wasn't booked like one. No other former world champion went crying to Jack Tunney straight after losing and demanding an immediate rematch. Macho, Warrior, even Duggan's bitch, Slaughter, didn't harangue the top brass about losing their belts. What's that about? <sighs> Whoever said that was awesome, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is a whiny bitch, but he gets what he wants. So why wouldn't you moan if you know that you're going to get your title shot? Is this? I, I know that. Backstage that it, or on camera? <laughs> it, this, it, it's Hulk Hogan. He is the same man on camera and at home, I'd imagine. I, I, I don't know. It's just, in kayfabe terms, why would you not moan if you know it's going to get you a title shot? You're a th- Other than the fact that it doesn't endear you to the fans. Yeah, you're a super baby face. Yeah. You're not supposed to moan. <laughs> <laughs> I have a moan. <laughs> Hogan gets the heat early on, stuffing his bandana into Taker's mouth as we get a shot of Jack Tunney, who literally has a ringside seat. Looks really odd as he's blocking the entrance way with his chair. Why wasn't he there? Like, why didn't he come out first? There was a big schmoz and the commentators were moaning about Tony not being there. It's so, like, call an end to the match. Stupid. Yeah, storyline-wise, he should come out first to say, hey, I'm around for the clean finish. Mm, considering I booked this match. Hogan works for and quickly gets the big slam on Taker, killing that spot. He actually got a fairly big pop for it. The start to this match was fucking booked to perfection. You had Hogan trying everything he could to put Taker down and Taker doing the, the sit-up spot. He did it like three or, well, probably five or six times. Thought it was done really, really well, actually. More so than I've seen Taker do before or since. I thought this was perfection. Do you know what else Taker did six times? Hmm. A fucking choke spot. Well, he kept going for the choke. No, six choke he spots. He actually got it on six times. I have them all counted here. Jesus. Yeah. Oh, yeah, a lot of resting. Apparently, this match is the reincarnation of Hulk Hogan. Uh, they're saying Hulkamania died at Survivor Series. I think, isn't it a resurrection? No, oh. he's immortal. It, it, is Hulk Hogan Jesus? Uh, he yes. died and he came back nine days later. <laughs> <laughs> and won his belt. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it didn't feel like Hulkamania died at Survivor Series. <laughs> I felt like the crowd died. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic taker zombie chokes and facial claws and old school. Or in this case, current school. <laughs> <laughs> like primary school. <laughs> <laughs> Hogan powers out with an arm drop at one. Yeah, cheers. Yeah. Not selling yeah. f- at all for the fucking current champion. Mm-hmm. He is the champion. Taker bounces off the ropes but catches his neck on the top rope. Ow. Heenan fobs it off as hitting a wet spot. You're supposed to bounce off the rope with just under your arm against the top rope, is it? Yeah, you have back flush against the ropes. Okay. You do your ribs and you break your ribs. So, nay bother as they just repeat the spot and Taker <laughs> connects with a flying clothesline 30 seconds later. Hogan arm drags Taker off the top rope. This spot must have been in every match. The heel goes onto the top rope, yeah. then the face arm and drags them off. I've actually got it, uh, the ramming a person into the post happening in all five matches tonight. Delo. Hogan hulks up, 
This signals the finish as, much like the Survivor Series, Flair comes to the ring, but unlike the Survivor Series, he is immediately sequestered by President Tunney. Hulk sees Flair and goes out to him and delivers a chair shot to Flair's back, who splats on Tunney, who sells like death. It's quite funny. Funny Tunney. Uh, Flair holds up a chair for Hogan's head, but Hogan throws Taker into it instead. Monsoon incorrectly labels it as a double cross. Hogan ducks and Bearer nails Taker with the urn. As we see Flair reviving Tunney, so he's looking at the in ring action, Hogan opportunistically opens the urn and uses a handful of ashes to blind Taker. I'm pretty sure the only thing in that urn is a massive light. There shouldn't be ashes in that. Yeah. Hogan gets his own brand of freedom powder and the Hulkster schoolboys take her for the one, two, three. That was a cheap tactic, wasn't it's it? Fucking, and it's disgraceful. That's like throwing a dead body in somebody's face. It's really, that's bad stuff. Like <laughs> Hogan's a fucking prick. Yeah, and no big boot or leg drop finish. You know? yeah. Hogan doesn't Hogan. do moves for 12 bucks, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, in fairness... The only way Taker should have been beaten is some kind of schmoz because he shouldn't be beaten by a big fucking leg drop. Uh, it's yeah, far yeah. too early in his gimmick for that. Yeah, He shouldn't have been beaten at all. And all yes. You probably shouldn't have put the belt on him if your only plan was to take it fucking off him again. Ten days later, yeah. on Tuesday, yeah. in Texas. In Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Fink announces Hogan is once again WWF champion. Like, Jesus, what round is this? Just this fourth, four fourth time. Round, yeah. yeah, so he beat Sheik, Macho, Slaughter, and now Taker for the belt. Yeah. So run number four, Hogan doing his hot dogging and grandstanding at four hundred percent speed. It felt like he had to get in as much as he could before storyline intervened. But no, he just cycles through his routines and promptly scurries to the back uh, for a point. Like I probably can't complain because I give out about how long he takes, but this one is. He does his routine really quickly and gets the fuck out of there like he doesn't give a shit. And he, yeah, it's like this house show mentality, just meh. Uh, so the show's over, but there's five minutes left of tape. Ah, it's just blank. No more big nets, just a test pattern saying, good night, WWF. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely test card. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have that freaky fucking clown from the BBC it test card. Go on, go on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, overall, what do you think of the match? I thought it was a bit pants. I thought that there was a lot of rest holes, non-moves, time-wasting. But I thought that the overall booking was okay. Like, Taker is a beast that can't be put down. Hogan, everything he tries, he keeps coming back. But overall, I thought it was a bad match. I thought it was slightly better than, than you did. Good points and bad points. Good points, as you said, Steve, was the start where Hogan is going apeshit. And uh, Taker doing the, the Michael Myers spot to perfection. Michael Myers spot, I like that. Yeah, yeah, What's yeah. the Michael Myers spot? The sit-up? You know, the, you know, the when Taker sits yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, really strange atmosphere as the whole pay-per-view has been just down. Mm. Know, subdued. Okay. I agree with <laughs> so that. Um, I didn't enjoy it as much as the Survivor Series match. It felt like Hogan really couldn't care less. The swiftness of the finish and the abrupt hot-dogging felt unfulfilling. Despite the babyface getting the big win and justice from the Survivor Series being served... Feels like they're really hinting at what will Jack Tunney do with another messy finish, you know? Uh, to find out on impact. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm surprised. I thought we would have closed the pay per view with a shot of, you know, Jack Tunney looking disgruntled. Um, up until then, he's been relatively gruntled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, what's the point in building up a guy solid for a year to bullshit him out of a title in. 10 days yeah like where do you go with Taker from here like the oddities I'm being sturgeon <laughs> <clears throat> alright let's complain some more in the aftermath <laughs> What is this Tuesday in Texas? Well, I'll tell you. It was an experiment to see if WWF fans would be willing to buy a cheaper pay-per-view at little notice if the storyline was right. So, the pay-per-view itself is a 93-minute show consisting of five matches, which seems pretty short to go and attend a show, you know? Uh, unlike WrestleMania 2, 
where the crowd showed up for four matches, half an hour, and watched the rest of it on telly. It was never planned to be an annual event, but if it had been more successful, it would have led to other impromptu, cheaper pay-per-views at short notice. It's kind of like what TNA are doing with their one-night-only BE pay-per-views. I think they're going to be disaster. Oh, they're going to die a death, but mm. at least they're pre-taped and months ahead of time. And who gives a shit? WWF felt it was a failure, obviously. They never did it again, and they reverted to the Big Four in 92. Uh, but the idea would morph into WWF's successful transition to monthly cheaper in-your-house pay-per-views. With regards to selling the pay-per-view if the storyline was right, in itself, Taker and Hogan's title controversy and Jake and Macho are more than enough to draw. The biggest problem with tit Tuesday in Texas was time to hype. The event wasn't announced until Survivor Series pay-per-view itself, so they had a week to promote instead of months of TV time. And the series became a setup show. So, had fans known there was another pay per view a week later, they would have been suspicious and probably put off, you know? So, did the fans bite? Tit <laughs> did around 140,000 buys, which is pretty great for seven days. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's not bad. Like, And what was the average at that point? Well, was it about 400? Like. Okay. Um, but 140,000 is the same number as WCW's pay per views surrounding it Halloween Havoc 91 and Starcade 91. Oh. Jesus Christ, and that's their mania. Uh, so what do you think of the show, Steve? I thought it was an above-average episode of Superstars. <laughs> and I wouldn't consider it like a, a, you know, a special event as such. Like the Jake Savage stuff was, was awesome. But again, that could have nicely fit on Superstars. First match with Brett was terrible. Warlord Bulldog, huge letdown after what we saw at WrestleMania 7. And then there was the filler tag match. And then the main event was below average. Not atrocious, we've seen a lot worse. Um, I'd be slightly more positive. I, I kind of enjoyed the opener a bit. I'd rather have something that's slightly different than five kick-punchy, shitty matches. I thought the Roberts and Savage match was shite, but the afters and the promos were absolutely incredible. Definitely worth the 12 bucks just for this shit. Uh, Bulldog Warlord, like like you said, was okay. It was worse than Mania. Uh, tag match was shite. Main event I didn't enjoy. Actually, yeah, it wasn't a great show. Hmm. Overall, the pay-per-view is a very easy watch. It was short, which means that they only catered for the most important feuds. Like, you know, here's the IC champion. There's the Roddy Magoos. Here's your boy Virgil. <laughs> Snake bite angle. World title. That's and done. Is there any tag champion stuff on this? Nope. But it was fine with leaving out the tag division and whatever Slaughter and Duggan were up to. Getting to see Repo win and Virgil lose was great. However, it was a sin to leave out Flair and Piper. That is a money match. Uh, Jake Macho's heat was off the charts and I was braced to see Hogan win, but so happy to see his selfish empire crumble. Uh, I don't agree with their BS business tactics, but I enjoyed the show, so uh, thumbs up. The WWF yet sparkling on the heel front with Flair, Jake and Undertaker. For once, they're actually carrying the promos for the feud, not the faces. So, how very WCW of WWF. <laughs> <laughs> I want a performance review for Jack Tunney. Storyline-wise, this pay-per-view was the fix to problems that happened at the Survivor Series. So, three kind of things related to him. Flair is going around with the video distortion. What, which, what did you do? Flair doesn't wrestle on the show. Fucking well done. Yeah. Jake attacking Macho with the snake. His situation's worse now. Although he didn't bring the reptile to the ring, he hit Liz and he's more unruly, so mm. things are worse. And the controversy about the WWF title, more controversy with the title because the finish involved an illegal weapon, the Ashes, and uh, Tony being involved in it as well. In all honesty, right, it just kayfabe logic. Why would you let people bring out illegal objects to the ring, therefore increasing the chances of one of them being used? It just doesn't make any sense, other than it's booked for him to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, Repo has a tow rope and then yeah. a massive illegal weapon. So, yeah, Tony, 0-3 for fixing these problems. He's made to look quite incompetent. And uh, if this was Raw, Vince would be out there with uh, oh, performance and, evaluation. And plus, he was laid out for the main event and he missed the schmals at the start of it. Yeah, what's that about? He's shite. All right, so let's hit the wrestling is... Awesome! <laughs> Figure four! <laughs> Segment. Awesome!
<sighs> it's that time again where we say goodbye. We've hit our silver anniversary. Episode 25 is in the books. Hold on, hold on. We hit our ep- silver anniversary next show. Unless it's wrestling logic, then it was this show. <laughs> <laughs> or last show. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> is Jack Tony's pension still intact? Will Jake continue his hand slap? Will OOC get his tenor back? <laughs> I guess we'll find out next time on OSW Review. And with a tear in my eye, next up we have perhaps the most famous of all the Royal Rumbles. It's the 1992 Royal Rumble. Remember you can catch all of our episodes, fuck, free of charge, FOC, and an IMAX flavoured 43 full screen at oswreview.com. And why not leave us a nice message, you American cunts? <laughs> <laughs> So it's a goodbye from Mr. Ossie mm-hmm. and Lee Wong, after and myself, Jay Hunter, and remember, a winner is you. The Hindenburg, excuse me. His hands and full his opponent. Oh. To be led down the aisle by his manager, Paul Bearer, from Death Valley, weighing 328 pounds. Sort of a hush has fallen over Madison Square Garden. He's got an urn. He has an urn in his hand. That's obvious. What is in that or who or what is I don't know. What are you usually put in an urn? Someone's remains. That remains to be seen. force the Undertaker is a huge man towering height and to, uh, check it out the yard together with Paul Bearer they are an absolutely devastating duo and the urn adds to all that sinister appearance of both of them look at it he never takes his eyes off the tugboat look at the Undertaker look at that Look at that face, look at those eyes. Look at, look at, look at, look at how he holds the urn. Look how he holds the, holds the urn close to his heart. And our camera there taking us right up close in the ring. You couldn't get closer than that. Oh, look at this! Undertaker not waiting, not taking any chances, wanted to get the upper hand immediately, and did in fact do that. Wow, what a matchup this is going to be. This Undertaker is one cold-hearted person. And what a matchup it'll be in just a week plus here at WrestleMania 7 when The Undertaker faces Superfly Jimmy Snuka. It appears to me as if Paul Bear is talking to the Urn. Certainly holding it very close to him there. While The Undertaker was doing very well. But look at here. Oh. Boy, is he quick. There's some meaning to that Urn. He holds it close. Look, look, now he holds it away. It seems like when The Undertaker is doing it, is doing it well, he holds it away from his body, and when he's not doing too well, he clutches yes. it close to his breast. It's your time. What, who could possibly be in that urn? 
Well, you better get a green trash bag if you're going to put tugboat in it. Well, so far here in the World Wrestling Federation, The Undertaker has indeed, your lordship, sealed a casket on many careers. He has, and I'm sure that Superfly Snooker is watching this match oh. and maybe dreading what he has to face in WrestleMania 7. Maybe not. We know Snooker has a lot of courage, but just look at The Undertaker. Now I looks. don't think I've ever seen anybody like him. Paul Bear now holding that urn up in exaltation almost. Now he's holding it close to his chest again. The guy's mixed he's up. He's rubbing it now. This is it. He's got a genie in there. Give me a break. Here. He's talking to it. He's talking to it. He's talking to some guys in the white coats. Tugboat was getting clobbered here. Bought a little time with that rollout. Now he's clutching it to his heart again. I'm sure he knows the guy's in trouble. He's really clutching it now. As Tugboat. Oh, what a close line by Undertaker. Oh, this man, six feet ten, 100 plus pounds. He is so athletic, so agile. He was at least six or seven feet off the crowd when he delivered that smashing blow. Look at him with a Paul Barry, your lordship, is talking to the current constantly. You know, he gave him that clothesline higher than Snooker comes off the top rope. Just about. Nobody comes off higher than Superfly Jimmy Snooker. Tugboat with a few big right hands, slow down the big guy. Look out, Irish whip in. No follow up, or a little bit late, and now, yo! Close lined him right out and over the top. But he's on his feet. He remained on his feet. And look at the way he's protecting the arm. Paul Bear holding that arm so close to his chest. Look at that. I want to know what's in that urn. There it is. Now the urn's way up. At arm's length. That's there he goes. He's going upstairs. Look at the balance, the agility. Oh, beautiful elbow right in the forget about it. He's got it's it. It's over. He's got it. Snooker. Chopped up another one. Services are in WrestleMania. That's what it's all about.